My name is Patty, and uh, I have four children, natural children of my own. I have two stepsons, and I have another girl who came to stay with me through the foster care system many years ago when she was a teenager. So basically, I'm the mother of six, and I have four grandchildren. One year ago, last Saturday, I lost my middle son, Benjamin, to a heroin overdose. Ben was a sort of a quiet baby when he was little. I think he was a little overwhelmed by his sister. She did all the talking. He was very quiet when he was little, and I, for a while I worried that he wasn't ever going to talk. And he, But when he did start talking, he proved that he could communicate very well. Uh, he it, it was always a little bit of an introvert, um, yeah, but he had a normal childhood, and he was fun and happy and active and a normal little boy. We did have sort of some turbulent years when he was a kid, uh, particularly when I got married to his stepfather uh, when he was six. And, uh, uh, but they were normal, you know, some, some of it was a normal uh, just life. The first time he actually got in trouble with anything at all was he was in middle school, got caught with some pot at school with a friend. And uh, that was the first sign that he was using anything or was going to be in trouble for anything. Yeah. When, when I married Richard, who was his stepfather, um, Richard had been clean. He was an addict. He had been clean, but quickly relapsed, and we all were introduced in particular to heroin. And so even though that wasn't Ben, Ben was just a little boy, I think some of the behaviors and, and the, the circumstances surrounding all of that over the next few years definitely influenced him. From the time when he, when he first got in trouble with the pot, he was about 13, I think. And from then on, following the recommendations of a lot of educators and counselors and legal people, you know, the, the, you, know you, you whisk him into treatment and uh, he was what's called a polysubstance abuser. When he was younger, and when he was get, just getting started out, he would pretty much use anything. He ended up making his, his drug of choice was heroin. He found an escape in opiates, and heroin was a struggle for him forever on. I'm going to say the first time he, when he started using opiates, he was probably about 15. And, and Richard's, Richard's relapse and, and uh, use of heroin was actually fairly short-lived. Um, after that, and he had a lot of health problems, and he, but he also took a lot of um, prescription medications because he had had a bad accident. So, and I'm not sure, at, but I believe that probably Ben would have obtained those from Richard's supply. Maybe, I'm not sure, but uh, I do know that a lot of the kids, I know that one kid was getting them from the grandma. You know, so that's how our kids do get them is from medicine cabinets at home. And I believe that's where these kids started getting them. I've consulted everyone that I can ever think of, every kind of service that I could ever get a hold of and get my sons to agree to. We jumped on every bandwagon. And Ben tried really hard, really hard. He really struggled. He, he didn't want to be an addict, and he knew he was. There's a family history as well, and uh, he knew he was an addict from pretty early on. 
he fought it terribly for years. I have a lot of flashbacks, really bad flashbacks from the actual, from his actual passing. Um, he had been clean for a while. He had been through treatment long, uh, at uh, PCN, had lived in a clean house for a while, um, a so clean and sober house, and he had come home to stay. Uh, and in retrospect, of course, I, I think that was probably the wrong thing. My younger son is also in active addiction. And at, at the time of Ben's death, he had had a couple of relapses, but once again was struggling. He had a job. He was working, paying child support um, and doing all that, really trying hard to pull it together. And I was so worried about my younger son that I didn't see what was happening with Ben. He relapsed and did it privately. The, then that night, I was very tired, very stressed out over my younger son. And my son, Ben, came in. He hugged me um, and he said, Good night, Mom. I love you. Get some rest. And at that point, my other kids were really working hard to protect me, to spare me from any more. And he went to bed. And in the morning, um, at 7.05, my phone rang. And I saw that it was, he worked at Wendy's. And I saw that it was Wendy's and that he hadn't gone up and gone to work. And I knew, I knew right then that he was gone. I jumped up and ran down the stairs and he was laying where he'd laid the night before on his back, on his bed, feet on the floor. And I knew that he was gone and I knew that it was going to be my last time with him. And I, I held his hand. I, I knew that he was gone. His, I mean, he was cold. And I sat there for about five minutes, holding his hand. I had one hand on his chest, and I was holding his other hand. And I knew that my life was going to be changed. All of our lives were going to be changed. And that I was going to have to call and tell my other family members and call the authorities. And I just wanted to take some private time. So I sat there for about five or maybe ten minutes just alone with my son. And then I went upstairs and, and I told Lonnie, my partner, and my younger daughter, Aubrey, was getting ready to go to school. And I told them what happened. And uh, then all the activity started. I called 911 myself. We're a large family, we're a close family. My daughters and their kids live two blocks from us. They were there instantly. My youngest daughter, who was a senior, just starting her senior year in high school, she had to make some of the calls and I, I feel bad about the responsibilities that they had to shoulder you know, the, the other kids. My youngest son was, we didn't know where he was. He was ended up, I, I found out he was in Eastern Washington. Everyone was trying to get a hold of him. He was actively using, and I was worried about what was happening with him. 
frantic to find him. Um, so a death like that is, there's a lot of activity around it. I felt like the eye of the storm on that. Um, I was just <sighs> paralyzed. <laughs> My Ohana friends swooped all in on me, and that was wonderful. My, I have a lot of friends. I live in my hometown where I grew up. <clears throat> my friends flocked to me. My house was chock full of people for days, um, which it helps. It, you might seem like it wouldn't help, but it helps to keep your mind off of everything and they help you through the details. I, I, I couldn't do anything for myself. I couldn't eat. Nothing. One of the things that I can tell you about those of us who have lost our children, when we talk amongst ourselves, there's not a whole lot said because we know that there's nothing to say. And we know that it's such a personal journey that there's just not, there's not really much, many words to offer. And they know that and I know that. Although I found their presence of my friends that have lost their kids the most comforting, in particular Judy. Judy was there. She didn't say much, but she, we commented on some shared experiences, and, um, but, she, but she knows that there's not much to say, and I know that too. I've, I've talked to other mothers, and lots of them, that have lost their kids, and there's not much to say. It's so personal.